Right, let's get started. Um, I want to start with a bit of video footage from the film Blue Velvet from 1986. It's the opening sequence. And we'll just leave it, we'll come back to it in, in a couple of minutes as to what the significance of that might be. But I'll draw your attention to the comments by the director, David Lynch, who said this, I learned that just beneath the surface there's another world and still different worlds as you dig deeper. I knew it as a kid, but I couldn't find the proof. It was just a kind of feeling. There's goodness in blue skies and flowers, but another force, a wild pain and decay, also accompanies everything. Okay, more on that disturbing set of events in just a minute. Okay. Now, to practice archaeology is to honour decay. Archaeologists often spend large amounts of their working lives engaging with ruins. The scientific archaeological understanding of site formation processes and taphonomics, death assemblages, examined during excavation and post-excavation <coughs> tasks are, in effect, discourses with death, decay and ruination. The process of archaeological excavation is often referred to as controlled destruction and the phrase preservation by record is the euphemism deployed to invert the reality of the process. Excavation is highly methodical and documented destruction. It should be emphasised, however, that excavation is also a productive, creative process, constructive of knowledge and knowledge claims. Even archaeology practised at the atomic level, say of radiocarbon dating, is a process that involves harnessing information obtained when an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by emitting radiation. Ironically then, the attempt to scientifically pinpoint and fix a moment in time in chronology relies upon the inherent instability of degenerative matter. I'll just pause for a second, I think someone's got their mic open, so if you could mute all your mics, that would be grand, because we're getting a bit of feedback, sorry, thank you. In fact, from the earliest awakenings of archaeological interest through to the grand tour of the 18th and 19th centuries, a contemplation on the spectacle of ruination has informed archaeological sensibilities. Ruins were fetishised from early on in this trajectory of the discipline of our early archaeology. Ruins have been received with a sense of melancholic wonderment, the loss of a bygone golden age, 
ruins are major cultural resources. And Svetlana Boym speaks of a bloom of ruinophilia in her Atlas of Transformation, 2011. Beyond the purely archaeological, the romance of ruins and the aesthetic of decay have figured heavily in art, literature and culture, as well as in the popular culture of Gothic horror. Where would our modern cinematic folk tales of horror be without the precursors set within the mouldering ancient dread of the semi-ruins of the castle of the undead Count Dracula, or Victor Frankenstein's attempt to arrest bodily decay and reanimate the dead? And as Dorian Gray discovered, there's always eventually a price to be paid for meddling in the natural order of decay. And let's not even get started on the return of the dead from beyond the grave, crawling towards us in post-apocalyptic US cities and sub-Bronte era reimaginings in the all-pervasive era of the zombie within current pop culture. As we saw in the opening video, in slightly more thoughtful filmmaking of the modern era, filmmakers such as David Lynch have summoned the horror that is to be found hidden behind the everyday American dream, the unsettling gritty filth and maggot-infested deterioration of the apparently pristine and shiny condominiums and neatly manicured lawns of suburban and urban order. Our very homes are in constant danger of being engulfed by a creeping entropy. Perhaps even more unsettling, David Cronenberg's mastery of the body horror subgenre has excavated the visceral decay and degenerative transformation latent at the very core of our physical being. More recently, the trend towards delight and decay has continued. Decay is a uniquely British B-movie style, uh, style movie take on the zombie horror format from 2012. Set at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, where things go very wrong in the midst of gleaming, cutting-edge scientific endeavour. Meanwhile, Decay, again, is a US horror film from 2015 about a man who has disturbing necrophiliac impulses, perhaps the ultimate fetishisation of bodily deterioration and decay. Even the futurist science fiction genre, seminal works such as Star Wars Alien and Blade Runner, bucked the early and mid 20th century trend toward depicting the distant future as a gleaming utopia, as seen in the likes of Fritz Lang's Metropolis, in favour of a grimy, heavily used, lived in future with a strong sense of future presence, which were solidly enmeshed in the look of their own realistic pasts, indeed, a long time ago in a galaxy far away. We've spent several centuries now in the West, being thrilled and entertained by the erosion of our own comfort and security, and the thrill of bearing witness from the vicarious comfort of the study library or lecture room to the decline and fall of empires belonging to others, for example, Rome, or our own legacy in the British Empire. There's been this sensibility in our own cultural history of an ambiguous mixture of delight and dread of decay and macabre delight in the dread, and the feeling of being continuously on the brink of being engulfed or swallowed up, rendered down to ruins. Well, you might well say, what does any or all of this have to do with Iron Age Brocks, ostensibly the subject of my seminar today? Prehistoric societies of the remote past presumably, probably, didn't possess sensibilities that included anything like our sense of nostalgia, romanticism, or the modern desire for gritty realism in futurist visions, or even the macabre delight and horror. Nevertheless, in contemplating what it may have been like to have lived then and there in the Iron Age, we need to consider that in the hyper-Atlantic drystone-built construction repertoires of the northern Scottish island groups such as Orkney, communities and individuals must have been frequently reminded of decay. They too lived within the paradox and ambiguity of continuous degeneration of their lives and works, even at the moment of their creation. There must have been a fairly strong conscious awareness of decay occurring all around them. As the tallest prehistoric structures in Northern Europe, Brocks have captured the collective imagination of Scottish archaeology for well over 150 years. A recurrent theme in both academic and popular literature on them is the marvelling over the remarkable preservation of the architecture of the best examples. Examples like Musa and Shetland are almost treated as exquisite corpses of the Iron Age, an architectural match for the actual Iron Age uncorrupted corpses <coughs> encountered in European bogs. Neil Sharples has referred to the Brock's extraordinary longevity as standing buildings by evoking the idea that they are the first permanent houses built for eternity. 
However, John Barber has questioned the longevity and stamina of rock engineering, pronouncing them all doomed to fail structurally. I'd like to explore decay and ruination and instability, further using a case study based upon the Iron Age Brock settlement site at the Cairns, which I'm currently excavating here in Orkney. Here's an example of the volume of rubble, and just to show just that sheer volume and mass of ruinous stone, just a sense of the scale of the site here. A few project facts so far, 13 seasons of excavation, which scares the living daylights out of me, 20 Iron Age buildings that we've partly or wholly excavated, thousands of artefacts that we've encountered and, and, and have to make sense of, 100,000 plus plus hand recovered animal bones, and thousands of environmental samples that we've taken in the process of, of excavating the site to what we hope is the best modern scientific standards. Here's a glimpse of the substance of both, I suppose, the excavation trench and the substance of the physical remains in the, in the trenches. And it's worthwhile bearing in mind that it's not just a broch, but in fine Orcadian fashion, we have a huge external extramural community, evident both in our trenches and in the geophysics that shows the extent and the substance of the extended settlement. That, arranged, that was arranged around the Broch, both during the contemporary period and later on. Well, let's turn back to decay and ruination at the Cairns for a second. Decay will have been noticeable and tangible at a range of scales and interventions in people's lives at this long-lived multi-period site. At one very intimate and personal level, there's the excruciating pain and horror that comes from observing one's own personal bodily deterioration graphically evinced in the human remains discovered at the site of an elderly individual who was plagued by serious tooth decay. Through his life, the man to whom this mandible belonged used his teeth as tools, a third hand to help manipulate materials to suit his ends. Probably one of the recurrent tooth tasks involved was flattening grass stems, pulling the stems through clenched teeth to make them pliable and workable for a variety of purposes such as weaving basketry and floor mats. This had resulted in the characteristic flattening of the cusps of the teeth and had seriously loosened many of them too. In fact, by the time of his death, he had only three left in the jaw and the other sockets had resorbed around the voids. Two of the remaining teeth were badly affected by decay, painfully present around the gum line. Indeed, this decay was of such depth and severity that it could possibly have led to further infection, soft tissue abscess, and ultimately hastened his decline and death. The pain and misery of this tooth condition, and no doubt other bodily symptoms of the aging process felt also, mean that he <coughs> was only too well aware of his own frailty and mortality, and more generally the universality of decline and mortality. How do we bear decline, mortality, the end of things, failing health, the decay of treasure places, all the outcomes of of the universality of entropy. Well, one approach I find useful is that taken by Derrida. In an interview in 1993, Derrida states, with perhaps more clarity and intelligibility than is the case in some of his writings, what he identifies as a major thrust of deconstructive history. He talks about the concept of stabilization and how human conventions, institutions, and consensuses are indeed stabilizations of something essentially unstable and chaotic, prone to change and dynamic in nature. Um, and I'll just read this, sorry, it's a bit lengthy, but, it, but it's, it's interesting. He said, what a deconstructive point of view tries to show is that since convention, institutions and consensus are stabilizations, this means that they are stabilizations of something essentially unstable and chaotic. Thus it becomes necessary to stabilize precisely because Stability is not natural. It's because there is instability that stabilisation becomes necessary. Now this chaos and instability, which is fundamental, founding and irreducible, is at once naturally the worst against which we struggle with laws, rules, conventions, politics and provisional hegemony. But at the same time, it is a chance, a chance to change, to destabilise. I think there's something interesting in this sense 
the, the decay, transformation, instability is full of potential as much as it's full of terminus. Um, thinking of those human remains again, we can consider the punctuation of day-to-day -day life by the death of household members and what measures were taken by the living to recognise their passing and culturally and psychologically process their absence, healing the social rupture that that entails. And the work of Morris Bloch and Parry is quite interesting here, and again a quote about marina funerals in Madagascar. There will always be a double aspect to funerals. One side will focus on pollution and on sorrow, and another side will always assert the continuity of something else. Now, the Cairns community must have possessed a heightened awareness of the eternal processes of change, decay and ruination. Sometimes they fought hard to prop up, fix, repair and maintain the inevitable collapse of their built lives, or enacted an elaborate repair on a crack in a precious wooden bowl, curating the past. Here's a really beautiful example of modest stabilisation. This almost complete wooden bowl is a near miraculous survival in terms of a its recovery from a terrestrial Iron Age site. Is this actually both holding back the ravages of time on a perishable organic item to maintain its utility and at the same time making a virtue of the need to repair this valuable, possibly renowned heirloom? The repair actually accentuates the preciousness, rarity, fragility and value. This object was broken, split apart and then the strategy for fixing it is adding even further to the visible layering of antiquity and value itself a miraculous survival in the present day, a miracle of non-decay. Here's some pictures of that wooden bowl that we recovered underneath the floor of the brock in a so-called well. And here you can see the repaired edges to it. And remarkably, when cleaned up and micro-excavated in the lab, the bowl turned out to have a series of wonderful bronze repairs on its surface. Very practical maintenance, but at the same time adding to the sense of the antiquity of the vessel and its unique qualities. I can't help but compare it to the Japanese art of Kuntsugi, where an aesthetic advantage is made of repair work and attention is actually drawn to the healed wound on a porcelain vessel through, through the application of gold <coughs> repairs. Here's another line drawing of it and you can see these wiggly bronze rivets. That's one repair area. There's a hinge on the, the, the rim. There's a staple here and another brace there. And if we could look over the other side of this line drawing, you'd see another set of repairs and rivets on the other side. So there are up to six individual repair zones on this wooden bowl. What I'm thinking here is that we can actually further define Derrida's concept of stabilisation to suit kind of archaeological and temporal matters. Maybe we can think about moving from micro stabilisation ultimately through durable stabilisation to what I might call ultra stabilisation. So we've got the bowl repairs, quite micro in nature, um, but also it turns out the bowl was immersed in a well and it was preserved uh, for posterity. Um, then we've got things like the bowl contents and the human hair in it, which are indicating to us that this bowl was in fact deposited as part of a very deliberate and intentional votive offering. Also, recent analysis of the bowl has revealed that there was butter in the bowl. Now, bog butter is a curious phenomenon indeed and very well known from Iron Age sites in Scotland and Ireland. And it's suggested by some scholars that butter is immersed in bogs and is given over as a votive offering or a sacrificial uh, offering over to whatever supernatural uh, beings are, are said to, to exist on the other side. Other scholars have suggested that bog butter is simply a, a fermentation and processing activity and that all these casks, bowls and hide skins of bog butter that have been found are simply never recovered uh, from that process of preservation and fermentation. One thing I would say is that the cairns were very solid evidence that it was never in, the bog butter there was never intended to be recovered and so maybe uh, what we're finding at the cairns in relation to our bog butter is actually backing up the idea that these are very deliberate, intentional deposits made for eternity, with the knowledge, uh, with the, the very much the knowledge uh, and intelligence that these things were going to last. Now, accompanying the bowl, apparently placed just beneath it, 
were excavated around 25 human fibres, uh, human hair fibres. They were about 10 to 12 centimetres long and, and each were cut at both ends. So there's a, a strong sense that there's an actual very deliberate structured deposit at work uh, in the material that's placed in that well. Here's a picture of the Broch for a moment, just to show you something of the structure of the thing. And it's a very well preserved structure. And in fact, it's one of the uh, one of the brochs that um, we can point to and say it has some of the best coherent layout um, of any of the excavated brochs, and a very strong idea of movement and and uh, occupancy within that structure. Some archaeologists have suggested that the circular nature of brochs encodes a, a cosmological setting of the world where the sun passes around them in a clockwise or sunwise direction, and I'm inclined to. I agree with that, although there are lots more details to eke out of the Broch cosmologies, I would say, and we can add to the three-dimensionality and verticality that we get with these amazing multi-story structures and with the, uh, the, the underground components to them as well, such as the well that we excavated at the Cairns that had the wooden bowl in. If we think for a minute of the early life of the Broch, sometime around the first century BC uh, to early uh, first century AD when it was constructed, we have a very strong sense of layout and purpose and intense activity in the structure. Um, there's a number of rooms that are laid out, but two in particular are very noticeably substantial and have a particular um, uh, intensity and depth of deposits in them. That's to say the southeast room here in the interior of the Brock, um, which is an earthen floor with hearths and with huge amounts of artifactual and environmental material recovered from it. Here's a picture of a large hearth, quite combusted and fire cracked at this stage. And from the floors in occupation, as I say, tremendous amounts of evidence of the day-to-day -day detritus, the lives, the working lives and practices of the community there. Here's some of the beautiful laminated, well-preserved floor deposits from the inside of the, the, the southeast room. And over in the west room, its counterpart, is another big substantial room with huge amounts of activity underway inside it. Seas of hearths, recurrent one after the other, no less than three hearths that we've so far excavated, more or less all on the same spot with just slight drift in terms of orientation. That's hearth one, we've not yet fully excavated it, but it's the earliest one we've encountered so far. Above it was hearth two, which is that heat affected slab there. Um, with a new series of paving over the, the top of it, or around it rather, I should say. And then uppermost, hearth three, by which time the floor deposits had changed somewhat and we've got earth and, and soil floor deposits that surround and engulf that hearth. But the overall sense is continuity, recurrence, repetition, um, uh, recurrence in the daily practices spread over a long period of time. Here's flow deposit close up, they show the riot of Jackson Pollock like colours and the charcoal and the rich unctuous matter, as the antiquities would have termed it, that's yielded up in these lovely well preserved baroque interiors. It's full of cereal grains and microfauna. It's full of artefacts and environmental remains, bone, animal bone, huge numbers of animal bone testifying to culinary practices and food culture within the building. There are bone artefacts, polished um, tusks or boar tusks like this, which may have been worn on clothing or even pierced through the body or worn as pendants. There's a vast quantities of pottery from the interior of the broch. There are all sorts of vessels that be token storage, food preparation, and also um, service, serving food. Here's just some of those spreads of pottery strewn across the floor. Large numbers of stone tools, very simple coarse stone tools used for pounding and grinding and generally processing food, cereals, foodstuffs of one kind or another. Lots of evidence for craft work in the form of textile production, um, objects relating to the spinning, uh, sewing and uh, weaving of uh, textiles and clothing. These dwellers in these centuries in the Brock in its primary phases also have recourse to finery, not just the boar tusks, but things like bronze rings, pins, even more rings, small little ringlets, 
Uckles, glass beads emanating from far afield, from as far afield as exotic Murrayshire on the one hand, to Al Jalama in northern Syria on the other hand, where some of the yellow pigment for some of these glass beads ultimately derives. Here's another beautiful Roman derived piece of glass utilised or reutilised in another type of bead, the glass bead. More glass shards, more beads, more beads. Um, and lots of uh, uh, installations related to processing the food. Saddle querns in this case. So what I think the picture, the impression that we're gaining here is of a busy, hard-working, sociable household operating recurrently within the broth for up to 200 or more years, establishing and reinforcing patterns and practices. And there's a very good, strong sense of durable stabilisation here in evidence. Let's return to our jawbone again. And since we know through C14 dating that both the date of the man's death and the date of the demise of that broch, uh, both likely in the middle of the second century AD, we can say that over his lifetime, the man to which the jaw belonged also witnessed the more substantive decay of the broch itself. He was between 50 and 70 plus years old when he died, a ripe old age for the period. When he was a young man, the social order that was represented by the monumental broch and by all that recurrent, repetitive practice and architecture was arguably at its height. The mighty broch was an unassailable symbol of power in the land, casting its long shadow across the slopes of the Winnet Valley, the valley that it sat within or above. <coughs> the sun's pirouettes about this edifice on a daily basis encoded the passage of time and the agrarian tasks that the community was committed to across the surrounding landscape, day in, day out, for up to three centuries. So as that period comes to an end and as that broth comes to an end and as that human represented by that jawbone reaches his culmination in his life cycle, we start to see things changing somewhat. We have Upright stone slabs that once marked the clear, mark, clear demarcation of the use of space and the repetition of access and activity that have snapped and lie prone where they fell, only to be rapidly covered up by hearth ash ejector and food refuse, the ongoing residues of living in the building in its final stages. We've got informal hearths and fires um, now built or constructed or set away from those central locations within those major rooms and up against walls, rendering staining, blackening, fire crackening and generally damaging and, and compromising the architectural stability of the building. Clearly, things have changed somewhat. There's fish being processed in these last stages of the old age of the broch in a way that is very uncharacteristic by the standards of the Middle Iron Age. Here's some more pictures of those informal fire events, fire spots and heart settings. And in this image, you can see that staining and cracking, swarms of cracks on the surface of the wall brought about by that haphazard setting of fires in the interior. As I say, lots of fish and lots of microfauna betoken in a richness of processing in the last, last moments of the use of the broth. Some more pictures of that fishy bone. And also, these deposits are festooned in what we like to call coprolites, faeces, faecal remains, largely from um, middle-sized mammals, we think, so cats and dogs and a few others. But they are everywhere, and they litter the floors in the last stages of the brock in a way that you don't really see trapped in the earlier floor horizons. Now, our notion of purity and hygiene is almost certainly occupying very different planes from people in the Iron Age, but nevertheless, it's interesting to witness that contrast. And this at this end point in the Broch's uh, activities. Now, the man's biography, his cycle of life, death, and the afterlife of his mortal remains were closely bound up with the life cycle of the Broch itself. This matching of his biography to that of the Broch encourages the idea that their deaths were also enmeshed, perhaps influencing each other's demise. So in many non-Western societies, the death of a person who has been closely or powerfully linked through residency with a particular house during their life often requires the death of that house as well. 
through demolition processes of one kind or another, or burning perhaps. Decline will have made appearances at many times and in many ways, and indeed in the monumental decay of the buildings that people constructed and occupied, they literally accommodated earlier generations' ruins in their midst, establishing practical and perhaps also metaphysical strategies for coping with ruination and decay. Here are animal bone groups, and, if, and these, are litter, these litter of occurrence all the way through the history of the site, from its earliest stages through to its last gasps in the Iron Age. And what they are is they're articulated groups of animal bones, which we find in very particularly formal deposits, as if they're posed and, and on display for a moment in time. These are very reflective and aesthetically set out sets of animal bones. They may, they may indeed be joints of meat, but if they are, they're also curated and choreographed in particular ways. Very often, we see three animals selected, a threefold uh, emphasis on on animals that display quite formally. Some of them are partially disarticulated. Many of these animal bone groups retain partial articulation. Um, as I say, um, in, in particular moments of tr transition and transformation on the site, we find them. Every time we think we might identify a new phase in terms of our archaeological reckoning, it's almost always accompanied by a litany of these sorts of animal bone groups. And often, multiple species selected, um, often three animal species or parts of three animals um, dedicated to these little animal bone groups on site. Oops. It's as if there's an attempt to harness, to fix, to pinpoint, to comfort through repetitive and recurrent practices of a ritualised or structured manner at the very moment where everything is changing in their midst. It's as if those crucial crisis points in the life of the community are tempered by recourse to these stabilising ritual practices of depositing in an age-old, timeless fashion that people have always turned to. A comfort, a psychological comfort in the midst of massive instability within society or within the lives of the community. Okay, now I want to turn again to some inspiration that emanates from well outside orthodox archaeology and even beyond the academic world as such. Green Green short story, The Destructors, published in 1955, is a story concerning a teen gang of boys in London set around the years after World War II. In the story, the gang inhabit the Wormsley Road area, a bomb blitz neighbourhood that hasn't recovered or been rebuilt. In fact, there's only a single fully undamaged house left standing in the street. It's a grand old beautiful Victorian multi-storey house owned by an affluent old man, a wealthy widower, who the gang refer to as Old Misery. At the beginning of the story, our anti-hero, Trevor, or T, as the gang refer to him, is a recent arrival to the neighbourhood, and he's from a down-at-heel, erstwhile affluent middle-class family who've fallen on hard times. His father is an out-of-work architect, which may well be symbolic. T begins a story on the margins of the gang, but his apparently inexplicable antipathy towards Old Misery rapidly gains some traction within the gang. When he hatches a plan to destroy the old house during a period of old misery's absence, his senior role is cemented, and it's not long before he's in outright charge of the gang. Most of the rest of the story concerns the planning and eventually highly effective execution of the destruction of the house, resulting in a mixture of comedic, farcical, and disturbing consequences for each of the main characters. Well, what I take away from the fictional, the destructors then, are various social truths. Graham Greene's destruction as a form of creation is something that I think is very much in keeping with what we witness archaeologically at sites like the Cairns and any number of others. But also what comes through very palpably in the story is how the conception, planning and hard work involved in the destruction is the basis of emergent power, leadership and control. The subversion and iconoclasm of the feverish desire to rip down the building may seem like the acting out of mindless anger, a form of nihilism, but there is a protest element to the act as well, and significantly, the formerly marginal outsider, T, takes over control of the Wormsley Road gang in the process. His bid for power, whether initially intended and looked for or not, is ratified through the very process of daring and enacting the destruction of the old order of things on Wormsley Road. Furthermore, what's clear in the story is that the act of destroying the old house 
which would previously have been an unthinkable act, both technically and in terms of audacity and morality, is made thinkable by the context of post-war London and the decay and ruination that already surrounds and engulfs them and threatens to swallow them up even 10 years after the war. And in this, I would like to pose the idea that following from all of that, that there's a contagion, there's a contextual contagion at work here that makes it thinkable, that makes destruction thinkable, and beyond that, that destruction itself might even be said to possess a form of agency, to have as much impact on people as people have in enacting it. Okay, if we think then <coughs> about the end points of Brock's, something quite interesting emerges from some work that was undertaken by Ian Arnott back in the 1990s, the early 90s of that. He suggested that contrary to most um, Iron Age scholars' viewpoints, Brock's in fact don't represent social stability. That in fact Brock's emerge because they need to emerge in the face of great instability and chaos and social problems. And that Brock's therefore are a form of stabilising, he doesn't quite put it in those terms, what he's suggesting is that Brock's are themselves an attempt to create more stable social and political conditions um, out of the chaos of the early Iron Age. So Brock's are only good for as long as they're needed and, while, and once that social and political conditions of instability are resolved, they're no longer needed. After the Brock's wane, new forms of architecture and new forms of personal material culture come to the fore which are far less monumental in their nature and far more portable over further flung extended networks um, of society. Um, at the Cairns, we can talk about them literally building on the ancestral pile in this post late second century uh, um, moment in time. The Cairns also forms part of this um, uh, event horizon, this end point that Arma and others subsequently have identified through ever more radiocarbon dates and excavation activity on sites. And at the Cairns we've got a whole series of buildings that are built over the, the remains of the Brock itself. Over a longish period of time we have building after building, structure after structure created on the site. And those buildings make use of the previous surviving stunted remains of the Brock itself. Um, they're utilising the creative and express, expressive potentials of that inevitable decline. There is hearth construction over the middle infilled areas of rubble, the centre point of a later Iron Age house, and the tools and equipment that are used to make those buildings, as well as tools that are uh, left as residues within or installed within the hearths themselves, visible and prominent, relate to the bygone era, era, perhaps the era of the Brock itself. What we can see is old working items are incorporated in a visually prominent manner within the substance of the architecture of these buildings. Not only that, but in many instances uh, we have uh, a sense that the old Brock is being referenced in the architectural and choreographed access and um, uh, occupancy of these late Iron Age buildings. So for instance there's a passageway into one of the late Iron Age buildings which both reuses Brock masonry and retains in situ upper elements of Brock masonry to form the passageway and then the floor is paved over with fragments of rotary quills. So you literally are stepping over the past as you walk into that building. And here's a picture of that passageway on the left and fragments, these semicircular fragments of the, the quern distributed and broken up uh, to form uh, the paving. So at the Cairns, I would argue, there was indeed an aesthetic of ruination under development constantly and emergently by the community. There's power and value to be gained in the present via contact with the rotted and ruined remains built by past generations of occupants. The Brock seems to have been deliberately built <coughs> itself back in its heyday in a landscape that brought the Iron Age community very close to an already ancient ruin. Essentially, there's a Neolithic settlement lying just 25 metres to the north of the Brock itself. 
Centuries later, when the Brock itself was reduced to a ruin, a subterranean structure or a souterrain was built which afforded access to the now entombed remains of the Brock in a highly controllable and regulated manner. Okay, time for some conclusions, would you believe already? Decay and ruination are inevitable and inexorable. And I, one thing I would say about that is, so what? Plus a change, it's the way of life, it's the way of humanity, it's the way of the universe. It's so inexorable that to some extent the physical aspects of decay and ruination are somewhat trivial. What's really interesting is how societies cope and create a new from it. Following Derrida, society itself could be said to be a stabilisation of that inherent instability. And social thinkers like Bloch and Parry see the mortality of persons as denied by the claim of eternity for society as a whole, instituted through recurrent long-lived practices. Destruction is a creative force. Context is contagious and, and gives rise to the thinkability of acts of destruction and ruination. And I would suggest that it may be useful to talk about strategies and technologies of stabilisation. These are proactive responses to ever-present entropy, decay and ruination. And I would humbly suggest that it may be useful to think of the scale and duration of these acts of stabilisation, from maintenance and repair through to major architectural renovation, and even to awesome acts of ultra-stabilisation that seem to effectively deny the process of decay altogether. I'd like to dwell on this finally. The world and human society are essentially unstable and chaotic in character. Institutions, structures, architecture and social formations are destined to deteriorate. What's remarkable is how human beings manage to stabilise this natural tendency towards decay and ruination, for the time being at least. And I'll leave it there. Okay. And, uh, and just one last thing. Happy Halloween, everyone. And here we go. Just to welcome you into Halloween mood. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for a very thought-provoking uh, seminar. I wonder if, first of all, if there's anybody 